Hello everyone, my name is Soumya Singh. I was very fascinated with this area of computer science called natural language processing, where we make computers understand natural languages or human languages, as opposed to languages understandable by the computer. And uh, techniques like these are very important to process the huge amounts of data and extract useful information from them. And one potential application and a very useful one of these techniques is detecting harassment online. Now, what is cyberbullying? Cyberbullying refers to harassment using electronic means, such as text messages, social media platforms, or email. It's very similar to harassment that happens in real life, where someone might come and say something damaging to you, and it has a devastating impact on your psychology. But this time, it's just done online. And it's really hard to control because of the massive amounts of data that's circulating online. And it's easier for people to approach you in the digital space. What encompasses cyberbullying can be a lot of things, which could be just saying something offensive to you or exposing your personal information online or trolling, organized trolls, which are often paid for, which is not definitely not uncommon. And it's usually targeted at a certain individual, which might lead to things like depression, self-esteem issues. And in some really bad cases, it has even led to suicide of really, of really young kids. And therefore, this is something that needs, uh, that needs attention immediately. Similar to cyberbullying is hate speech, but this time hate speech may be directed to a group of individuals as opposed to one single individual, which might be on the basis of religion or ethnicity. And even though public discussion forums and social media websites have things like the report abuse or forum moderators whose job is to make sure that these places of public discussion are respectful. But with the growing amounts of data online, it's really hard to intervene manually and to take action in time. And sometimes, by the time something is reported, the damage might have already been done. And this is where maybe technology can play a very important part in curbing harassment online. There are different kinds of methods that could be used. For example, one is rule-based algorithms. Now, rule-based algorithms, as the name suggests, is where you specify a set of rules to detect what text can be classified as harassment. For example, I might specify that if I come across a swear word or a certain phrase or a hashtag in my text, that should be classified as bullying or hate speech, which is fine, which sounds good. But in practice, it's not really feasible because when you think about languages, there are so many ways people could use it to express themselves, especially on social, social media where people use slangs and deliberately or sometimes unintentionally misspell words, use special characters to kind of, uh, you know, hide curse words or, um, or even for some languages other than English. For example, languages like Hindi, which do not use the same script as English. People might, uh, people would write this stuff in Hindi, but instead use English characters, which is known as transliteration. So if you think about it, how many languages uh, can you specify the rules for and how many rules can you actually specify for each language, which is absolutely not practical. So this is where another kind of algorithms called machine learning algorithms come into play. Now, for those of you who don't have an idea of what machine learning is, I'll give a very quick overview with a very simple example. So the basic idea of machine learning is to feed in loads of data and let the machine learn itself uh, based on what patterns it extracts from the data. So the, the basic working of a machine learning algorithm is you feed in loads of data while also specifying what the data is. So having the light, right labels then there is some complex mathematics going on. And then based on that, it would try to apply, uh, apply the same knowledge it gains to an unseen data set. 
For example, let's take a very simple algorithm where we feed in lots of images of different animals and we want the algorithm to classify what species it is. For example, I have lots of images different animals and the algorithm should be able to say this is a cat, this is a human, this is a rabbit, this is a bird, etc. As many species or categories you like. So in this case, we take in lots of images of different animals and with each image we add in a label that this is a cat or a dog or a human based on whatever the image is of and then feed it into the uh, algorithm the algorithm will extract features from each of the image. For example, it will notice that for each image of a cat, there is a certain shape of ears or a certain kind of a nose, then it's whiskers, etc. Similarly for humans, the kind of limbs, the position of the mouth, the position of nose, the position of ears and such things. It would, it would extract features for each of the present categories and then we feed in some unseen data. It's very important that none of the data that is used to train the algorithm is passed into the test set. So we put in those images, but this time we do not label any of them. It's the job of the algorithm to classify them as the right animal species. And then against what it offers us, we then measure the performance. So this was a very basic idea of what, uh, machine, uh, what machine learning is. Now, machine learning is usually has just one layer that performs mathematical calculations. Therefore, we look into something called deep learning, where the only difference is that deep learning has many more layers, which could amount to maybe even hundreds of layers. And in each layer, the representation of data is very different from the previous one, which helps in capturing more complexity in the data set and therefore works well for more complex things. For example, languages. Now, okay, machine learning might work fine for cats and dogs, but when you think of languages, there are things like long-term dependencies in sentences. For example, if I say, the table on the fifth floor of the building next to my house is broken. Now here, broken stands for the table. So there's a relationship between table and broken, which are far apart inside the sentence. And it's easy for us humans to understand because we know the language. But that's not how computers work. <laughs> Unless you really train them, they won't be able to understand. But deep learning algorithms are a lot better at capturing such complexities than machine learning, and which makes it very suitable for very large data sets, particularly for text. Now, this is definitely a very promising solution. And there, are, there has been extensive research in this area, which gained momentum in the last few years. And there are models which promise an accuracy of as high as 96%. But there are several limitations to it which improve the scope for research. Uh, for instance, the most important aspect of any machine learning model is its data. It's important to remember that your model is only as good as your data set. When collecting data, there are so many things you need to consider. For example, the volume. Now, these models will definitely not work with a very small amount of data. So you need enough data to be able to extract something of substance. But what exactly is enough? For maybe systems like these intended for commercial use, it's terabytes and petabytes of data comprising of billions or trillions of data samples. And now for classification algorithms, we need label data for training and definitely labeling millions and billions of data samples manually is extremely time consuming and prone to errors. Also, the data we might collect might be very biased or unbalanced. So we might have more samples which are classified as, or sorry, labeled as non-cyberbullying as opposed to cyberbullying samples. And the model isn't going to learn well if it does not have enough samples to identify what exactly makes bullying. So it wouldn't work well even if you feed in the test data, all samples of possible harassment, it would still classify all of them as non-bullying, which is definitely not a good model to work with. The context, of course, is the hardest part. And this is something we haven't been able to achieve so far. For example, uh, something which is classified as offensive text due to use of cuss words might just be a lighthearted exchange between two best friends.
and a possibly polite sounding piece of text might actually be very sarcastic and therefore very damaging to the recipient. The data availability is uh, also one very, is kind of a hindrance in progressing this research, especially when it comes to other languages. Now, English is the most used language on the internet, no doubt, but harassment happens in all languages online. There is research for it, and it is time we need to do something to, uh, to work towards it. Now, considering these factors, there are some possible um, solutions for improvement, which comes in the form of unsupervised learning. Now, now, what I talked about so far was supervised because we were kind of spoon feeding everything into the algorithm that, hey, this is cyberbullying, this is not. But especially where there is a lack of data set, we might want to extract information from very little or maybe sometimes even no label data. And one of these methods could be adversarial training. Adversarial training is something that's popular with images and has only recently been tried for tech. So now here the job of one uh, algorithm is to generate data samples and the job of the other is to identify whether it's real or fake. And that's how it learns. The second option is transfer learning, where I could train my model on a completely different data set and use the parameters, where parameters are essentially the amount of math I need to do to extract insights, the number of layers I should have, the amount of data I need to train my model on, etc., and all these things, and apply it to a different one. For example, I have a good working model which could differentiate fake news from real news. I train a model onto that and then use the same parameters and apply it to cyberbullying, where I might not have enough data for, and then see if it works or not. So this was a very quick overview of what's currently the state of the art research in this area of harassment detection using machine learning. And there is some more uh, possibility of future work. So if you think about it, social media is a massive graph of connected people where A is friends with B, B is friends with C, C is friends with D and D is friends with B again. So if you map it out to the whole world that uses a social media platform, it's a big graph. And uh, and then you could gather some insights in terms of which user is most of the harassment texts coming from, which region, etc., and who are the possible victims. And this is particularly useful in identifying, say, bots or paid trolls, and uh, then maybe take an early action against them. We could also combine this with other technology methods, for example, um, speech to text, where you might have bullying in the form of a video. So you convert the speech of the video into text and then apply the same methods to it or text extraction for images where something offensive might not be written as text but embedded as text inside an image and you could extract that and perform the same on it. So that's pretty much it from my side. This is a good overview of what's going on in the space and I definitely urge you to read up more about it. Maybe try out some tutorials online for machine learning to get to grips with what it is and then it will help you understand better of how it is being applied to all these practical applications. Thank you.